if you win the lottery, it feels good because you did nothing to deserve it except buy a ticket. If you spent 25 years building what you would have won in the same amount of money you would have won in the lottery, it doesn't suddenly feel like, oh, I've now done it. It's like, no, I worked for that. took a lot of time. I had to sacrifice. I do these things. The, the reason is an instant gratification, which is a problem I think we spoke about in the last pod about life in general, like that people are so fixated on instant gratification and that's not going to be good in trading because it humbles you guys welcome back to the show today we have max in the studio what's going on brother good to it's see so you good man to see you. you came in my old studio we did a banger of a podcast two hours <laughs> we did two hours and then you can tell the story mate uh technical issues you yeah know. we uh it, we didn't get the recording we had an earthquake got thrown out the exactly. window we got yeah, it, fire everything. we had a fire yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> but finally we have you back on the show guys yeah, as man. always in the comments down below you will find this beautiful man channel even Thanks, though you should bro. know by now because you have one of the best one of my favorite youtube channel where you go live you do some ta which we're going to talk about it but before we dive into it do you mind to give us an intro and tell us about yourself I'll say it all again. But it was a few months ago anyway. And, it's, and also, I want to make a point because we were in that podcast, we were talking about determination, mindset. smiling mindset, and all that kind of shit. And you know what? At the end of the pod, when we lost it, we both looked and said, we have to stick to what we were just saying. Exactly. <laughs> and we just rolled up. We're like, you know what, mate? Don't worry, man. I'm so happy. I'm, I'm so happy we lost it. <laughs> nah, we can do it again. But yeah, my story is um, pretty simple. I, I, you know, it's, I started as a trader first. So I'm not some guy in crypto, straight in crypto. Uh, I was uh, started trading when I was 22, 23 years old in Australia. Um, and I came down that path due to the fact that I didn't want to work for other people to sweat and work for them to make money or trade time, basically. You know, it, I didn't want to have to trade time to make money. And I was in Australia. I was on a working holiday visa. There was no work. There was no there was no holiday in, in that journey. So I just realized, like, if I don't find something that I can do on my own time, and make money with my own brain and use my brain and myself to make money and I'm never going to have freedom. That was kind of the, I, I actually was early in that as well. Cause I remember working some shit jobs in England, you know, I was working in uh, Ladbrokes in bet in betting shops. I was working in on the phone doing tele sales, like listening out. Oh, yep. Sorry. So, and I just thought to myself like, there's ne even if I got to the top of the it's still not going to be freedom because even if I become the manager of this place, I'm just gonna have to be here all day. I'm not, I wasn't a bad kid, but I was a naughty kid. Let's just say that to say the least, actually. Yeah, it makes two of us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best way, bro. Yeah, so I kind of, uh, I, I stumbled across trading because I was trading the Australian dollar and the Great British Pound. I was looking at stock shares, indices and individual kind of tickers like gold, for instance. And I was kind of interested in, oh, I could just look at these charts and maybe work out what's going on and then make money without... I could make it from my laptop. I could make it. And I was in that era. I wasn't the dial-up era. I didn't need a broker. I could get straight into the market without having to go through a third party. And it was even more, at that time, it was even better to a degree because it was almost like now today, everyone has access, which is great for the market, but it was almost like a little bit earlier. This is 10 years ago. Less competition. Uh, exactly. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually an interesting question because is it better now? Yes. Than before. But it was at a point where you could get into stuff that hadn't risen so much because obviously we've seen so much printing of currency, bubbles being created. And I think some of the markets, which we got into, obviously Bitcoin, I was so lucky to, I always think to myself, if I was just born five, six years later, I would never have made this journey in Bitcoin. And that, like, that's a massive win for me. One of my biggest wins. Like, I was trading FX, I was trading individual stock shares, doing CFDs, PIP charts, you know, all the bull making $200 in one day, losing 500, making 700, losing 400. And just doing that for years, mate, like for years and not really getting anywhere. Yeah, let's go, brother. Give me that. I need the caffeine. Like I said, I was, uh, I was out last night with some naughty cheek and I'm getting older. They have too much energy. Thank you, mate. But yeah, so my story is, um, humble actually, you know, it wasn't like I had any any information anyone else didn't have. It wasn't like I knew anything else that any, anyone else didn't know. All I was just, I was just a dude who came out of the, the recession, essentially, the, the 2008 recession, with a family that had done well before, but been damaged by it, and just had to kind of just come up with my own solution for that. Not in terms of poverty, I was always middle class, I always had like a good education. There was always food on the table, for instance, for me. It wasn't like I had to go and make my own money for food or anything like that. But there was ups and there were downs, especially in the UK with higher prices at that point. And then I kind of got into trading. I was trading, I thought I had an edge on the Australian market. One of the biggest lessons I ever learned at the beginning was the news is bullshit because I thought the news, because I lived in Australia, I thought I would get an edge because I was in Australia and the great British pound being British and being Australia, in Australia at the time. And I just fell flat on my face trying to 
essentially analyze the news market and then try and have an edge. Oh, look, this is happening on inflation. This is happening here. Oh, are they, what, what's the, the, the interest rate going to be? And I was just like, dude, like, no, like I, I, I fell flat on my face. And then individual stocks and shares was the one part of it. And then I heard in the trading community about Bitcoin and dude, like my name is MDX Crypto. It's not MDX Forex. Like I, I just essentially saw from an early point same for you. We, but we, we, people in the crypto community, and it wasn't that early. I'm not saying I was an, an early, 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 crazy, you know, f***ing tinfoil hat dude who got in really, really early. It was about 2015, 16. A lot of us just identified in 2016 that, you know, I can sit here trading pip markets and it, even the word pips annoys me. Like <laughs> I'm making a pip today. So <laughs> it's so depressing, like the whole journey. And there is money to be made, but you're trading against banks and it's difficult and you have to have high, you know, not even high leverage, sorry. You'd have high equity to get the leverage, go through accredited systems. And it's not as easy just to be a, it's not like there's there's no like, you can make millions quickly in, in trading the stock market. Of course you can. But in comparison to the asymmetric upside, which Bitcoin offered and actually played out and we all benefited from it, Bitcoin was definitely my best trade of all time. Of it, like it had to be. Like there's nothing which could have beaten that because I got in at six hundred dollars and now it's trading at seventy five. Well, a little bit less at the minute. And um, yeah, I just kind of dived into. I had a little bit of trading knowledge. I never started a trading channel. I just traded the market on my own. I actually started my YouTube channel in two thousand and nineteen. So just a flashback: six hundred dollars went to twenty k. Traded that whole market. Got into the altcoin market. Traded that as well. Did quite well. Lost a lot of it, though, in the 2019 time because of the volatility and we were all over levered on BitMEX, for fuck's sake. <laughs> like, BitMEX did well. Well done, Arthur. Got some of my coin, brother. Yeah, it was... Uh, and then that, that 2019, I started a YouTube channel, which was honestly, mate, I just never thought it was going to be what it was. I, 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 you know, you always hear this from like... you. I never thought I was going to be famous on YouTube. Like, I'm not famous either. I'm not... I just never thought it was going to be suddenly out of nowhere. I was going to have... 50,000 people tuning in to watch a video in, two, in 21. I just, did, I just thought I was going to sit there and talk about just general trading topics and not live. I, the live thing was so much later as well. I was just like, I, I remember my first video was me talking about a stable coin. Just been like, this is interesting. Maybe you should hold stable coins instead of US dollars and then you could get into crypto easily. And that video got like 8,000 views. It's still up there somewhere. And uh, then uh, one of the communities, one of the little token communities called EOS at the time, latched onto it because they were like, that's built on EOS. Oh my God, it's on our platform. And they all followed me. And then I was like, cool, I was in the EOS community for a bit, like talking to them and doing some mainly fundamental analysis at that point. And then people, well, it was just the views. I looked at the views. If I did a trading video, it got this many views. If I did a, tr a video about a coin's fundamentals, yes. it got that many views. And I thought, okay, let's just take a little bit of the experience I have from traditional markets or trading stocks and shares and shit like that. Put that onto a video, see if they like it. And then... 21 was when it all kicked off the channel, went from like 10,000 subs to 80,000. So, and that was, that was fun, bro. And to be honest, that wasn't me really trading that much. <laughs> it was me screaming and shouting on stream. <laughs> I remember yeah. the desecrate the like button. Desecrate the like button. Uh, I, was, uh, I was watching you from the UK. So we are talking about 2020, beginning of 2021. Yeah, it was 2020, yeah. I was following Arcor three or four people and you were one of them. That's why Indy never seen podcast because it's burning yeah, the fire. The house going on, yeah. <laughs> I mentioned it, but do you think it's still early for crypto? Yeah. I, you know, this is one of those questions I always get from like no coiners. Yes. But there's two ways to look at it because there's the way to look at it. Are you going to get 20,000%? Probably not. But you're, you're, a 10x or a 20x is still there. And like, that's still early. Like if I was going to get a 10x, like I, I even trade Bitcoin sometimes. I'm just like, like so happy of getting 4% every minute, basically. <laughs> like, and I'm like, this is so mental, like how it moves so much coming from where I was like before, where it's like half a percent and then it takes a week to stop doing this. And then you get some bullshit news, which messes everything up. No, I, I think it's still early, bro. Like for, let's just say, we're not the crazy tin hat fall dudes who got in at the very $10, $20, $30, even though I do remember buying Bitcoin for other purposes at those points. But I'm never, I'm never that guy's like, I bought like some shit on the internet when it yeah, was yeah, in same. 2000. And I'm never that dude who's like, I got into Bitcoin in 2012 because I bought something on the internet with Bitcoin. It's like, no, bro, you didn't, it wasn't an investment proposition. You were just doing it to get your ball <laughs> on the internet. There were some points, but I'd say, yeah, in, in terms of the investment the institutional investment field, 100%. In terms of maybe retail, I would say, I had this conversation literally like two days ago. I was like, we're not the early adopters anymore. It's like the late adopters or the, let's say the early, late, we're not, we're not in the middle yet. 
Okay, so it's not like the, the majority are in yet. I would say it's the late early adopters. And then the majority will probably be the end of this market cycle. When the institutions jump in, then you'll probably get to the, the late adopters or let's just say the laggers, right? I think we're kind of in that little part where it's like the S curve is about to do the most aggressive up bit and then we're going to do the curving off. And I think it's not it's still early, but it's not early for like the 20,000 percent and the altcoins and the bonks and all this bullshit and Doge doing that. But it just depends on who you are, really. It's a question about who you are. Like, if you're an institution, then yeah, because no other institutions are in. Just look at the market. How many people in America own Bitcoin? 70 million? Okay, you're not you're not the first 10 million. Institutions, you're very early. Like, there's there's probably clearing houses, brokerage houses, money management firms, family offices, massive equity floating around in just markets like Dubai, like companies that could be liquidated and that money could go into an investment. ETFs. When people ask me, is it too late? I always say no, because I think anyone, no financial advice, anyone should take a portion of their portfolio and say, I want to risk this much into crypto, which means it's going to grow. But there is an exponential curve, right? We will not see the returns we've seen in 2013, in 2010. Those returns are off, like off the charts. 10x, like you said, 15x, it's going to grow less and less and less exponentially, right? So yeah. it's not too late, it's not too early. I think we are right, uh, like you said, we are just in the spot where institutions are coming out. I mean, today I watched a video of Larry Fink saying, I was wrong. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's a good thing. So He always was, he just now realized it. Exactly. They so, all were, like, you know... And they're going in heavy, like they accumulated so many. Yeah, yeah, one percent of what they've got is every single f-ing retail dude from the last five years. Exactly. So, like, yeah, it's. But crypto as a sector offers a ton of opportunities, right? Especially if you want. I mean, I, I'm I'm no trader. We discussed it last time. I buy and hodl good projects, yeah, yeah. but you can find gems. You can have the underdogs. The especially now with memes, man, it's just like freaking lotteries. So, can you make yeah. money with this thing? Yes, there is a rainbow of. Uh, risk, right? If you go in Bitcoin and just hold Bitcoin and every eight years you check your portfolio, I think you are winning. Tell me if I'm wrong here. If you have gone into Bitcoin in 2010, you probably most likely sold most of it. Imagine buying... Well, someone a- logical would. Right. You have to be crazy not to in a lot of cases. So people get so upset. Oh, I should have held my Bitcoin. Well, you wouldn't have You made 20,000%. Like- you wouldn't have it. Because you, you, you are buying, let's call it $1, right? And now we've seen $70,000. Imagine how many opportunities you have. $5, $10, $50, $100. It's doubling up every time, yeah. $1,000. I mean, $10,000. I mean, of course, unless you are someone which there are, some kid like Max Kaiser and Da Vinci, shout out Investors, to all of them. Yeah. You know, when you don't have a lot of money, you want to take money off the table to increase your standard of living in a lot of cases. Exactly. So, so now that we kind of established that it's not too late, but it's not too early, I mean, how would you play the market now? Because technically we should be in a phase of the bull market. We've not seen, like you said, those massive returns yet. How would you play? All I can say is how I'm playing it, you know, because everyone is different. And like that's one thing in trading. But I think it is really crucial. And I've been saying this more and more and more as I've been doing this for longer and longer, is you need to have multiple different angles and multiple different strategies all at the same time if you want to squeeze out and execute as much of the money as you can as possible. If you want to just hodl, that's fine. You're an investor and hodl it. You go up, you go down. You're not going to have the highest, highest, highest gain or return because obviously you're just going to get what what you get. Essentially, you're just the fly on the back of a horse. The horse is going in that direction. You're not steering the horse. You're just going with it. That's hodling. You're You're just going to get what you get, okay? But you have to remember as well, though, just to make one point to what you said before, is t- there's two different ways. Is your Bitcoin rising in price or are you trading to make more Bitcoin? And then that rises in price. There's a difference. There's, there's some people who are investors and some people who are traders. And there are some people who are looking for more US dollar appreciation in investing. But there are also people who are investing want more Bitcoin. And there's also traders who want more US dollars and more Bitcoin. So there's multiple facets to each part of what a trade really is. Like Because if you're just buying spot, and waiting for the price to rise, that's a gain in US dollar valuation, but not a gain in Bitcoin. You want to get more Bitcoin. That's another whole trade in itself. That's a percentage within a percentage, if you understand what I'm saying. So I have a trading bot that it shows on the spot side what it makes in US dollars, but then we also have a set aside which shows what it makes in Bitcoin. So how much more Bitcoin have you got as well? But that's another whole thing. But yeah, so I have it broken down into four different things. And I think it's super crucial that people need to have a proportion of their portfolio automated if you want to squeeze out the gains. Because a really good example was on my channel was saying, I do think Bitcoin's gonna have a pullback to the lowest part of the range. Okay, I don't wanna go into numbers because I'm gonna be doing this on the thing because no one, this could be watched in two years or something. 
Um, there was a really good opportunity for a short recently, um, which I missed because my parameters didn't get met. And it happened at a point where it would have been impossible for me without essentially being a vampire to get that trade open. <laughs> yeah. As simple as that. So like, and I missed that trade. I wanted to get a million dollar short, but I missed it. But because I have a proportion, 40% of my Bitcoin in my trading accounts is traded with my trading bot. I still managed to capture 27%. Okay. 27% on a smaller amount of money, which was a, was a I sold 50% of my 40% of my Bitcoin in my trading account went to USDT. It dropped 27%. So I made 27% if I rebuy the Bitcoin. So the automation is really crucial. You can go online and you can find very simple strategies that have been back tested for years, decades, even on multiple markets. Um, all the edge is patience. Because strategy, having a profitable strategy is usually not to do with you know something that someone else doesn't. It's not usually to do with that. It's usually to do, do you have the patience to stick with it over a longer period of time and weather the storm when it has a drawdown? Sorry to jump in. It's the definition of the casino, why they win, because they always play. If you go to a casino, you're not there to win. Like that, because if you went in there and you won your first bet, Okay, I'm going to leave now. I've only been here 10 minutes. No, you went That's to the casino to play. And you're not <laughs> yeah. going to leave after 10 minutes. No, you're, you're, you're going to lose all your money always because you're emotionally attached to the feeling of being inside the trade or the gamble. Like this, the wheel spinning is the part where you're like, what's going to happen, brother? It's the same as what's going to happen to the price when you're in the position. So if you're a gambler, do not trade. You just leave that for the casino and have an amount of money that you're prepared to lose. And if you come out one time, 8K up, and then the next week you lose five, don't worry about it because you're going to win and lose. Your overall, your curve, your equity curve cannot be good. <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a gambler and my equity curve is up. Like if you're one of those guys who can do back or rack or you can do poker and you can do it extremely well, there is skill involved in that. But to be skillful is difficult. So most people can't do it. They'd rather feel, it's, if you win the lottery, it feels good because you did nothing to deserve it except buy a ticket. If you spent 25 years building what you would have, one in the same amount of money you would have won in the lottery, it doesn't suddenly feel like, oh, I've now done it. It's like, no, I worked for that, took a lot of time, I had to sacrifice, I do these things. The, the reason is a, an instant gratification, which is a problem I think we spoke about in the last pod about life in general, like that people are so fixated on instant gratification and that's not going to be good in trading because it humbles you like that. But back to my point about the four different things, 25% needs to be DCA. 100%, just DCA, buy it every single day, strategy. In, in on S&P 500, if you DCA, you will only not, okay, if you DCA into the S&P 500 for the last 50 years, a trader would have only have managed to make 30% more than you. Only 30% more, really. And a lot of guys don't even make any money in trading because they lose it all because they go on tilt, they get emotional. So if you want to mitigate your risk, just DCA into the S&P, DCA into Bitcoin, and traders don't really make that much more. It's only a very small minority of traders who have the exceptional big wins, and then there's most of them are just either 30% or nothing. And then you've got Bitcoin, DCA into it, and you've got, so I've got DCA, swing trading strategy, which is my bot, and predominantly, I still have some Bitcoin. So swing trading is trying to identify with 25% of your money when the market will swing from high to low on a higher time frame. Lower trading, high probability setup trading. So weight on the market and wait until you see a high probability high probability setup. This takes a little bit more, you know, learning. I have a company which we teach this and we have, you know, MDX algo, for instance, yeah, we have eight indicators. Say, yeah, yeah. We have a I have a whole company. Comments, yeah, 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 amazing. Like that that company's grown so much and it's all what I do every day now, pretty much. Like the YouTube is great, but I'm building that baby to help people. But um, yeah, so that part is um you need to have twenty five percent in scalp, which I would say because you can, you know, it's scalp and swing are subjective because you can have a swing within a lower time frame, which is in a range. You can have a scalp, which is a scalping down on the, on the daily, which means it's not going to break a trend, for instance. The terminology I'm trying to talk about, swing is medium to long term. Scalp is shorter term time frames, and you're looking for that high probability setup. So you're waiting for parameters. Say you've got a spreadsheet and you've got five or six things on it. When those things begin to happen, you tick them off. And if all five of them are ticked, you take the trade. Perfect. High probability setup you can make with leverage as well. I'd say use leverage on this strategy. I definitely recommend using leverage because you don't want to have $1 million in exchange. Just have 100K and 10 exit. And then you can have that other money somewhere else yielding, doing things. And if you're using limit orders and you're using, say, if you're using limit orders to get in and out, you have to use that equity. So I'd say you have 10X leverage so you can get, you can take from the exchange in terms of you can use the tool in an intelligent way to mean that you don't have to lock up a whole load of money and then not have it potentially in another investment. So use leverage on high probability setups, not on 
don't use perpetual swaps for a medium term swing. It's stupid. Just yeah. buy it spot or get a quarterly future. I said this to everyone. Like, don't go on perpetuals and pay funding for seven months. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's they make the money, not you. And like, and then the last proportion of it is your investments. But and I would classify investments as you could do a shitcoin, you could do a meme stock, you yep. could do Tesla, you could and just investments. And an investment in what I determine an investment is something that you would hold and you always will hold for longer than one year. In traditionally, I'd say five, and Warren Buffett would say ten. But I would say Warren Buffett, he's a bit boring. It's a long f-ing time, and he's done it great, and he's a billionaire at 86, but he can't go party on a yacht with loads of cheekers at 86. So yeah. I'd say, fine, that can make you money. But I'd say you need to have, in the investment circle, right, it needs to be longer than a year in crypto you're going to hold it for. And investments, your edge in investing is the due diligence you do in the project. You know about the team, the funding, you know about the, the PE ratio, you understand the, you understand what the roadmap is. You see an idea that hasn't grown yet in the market. And all you're doing in investing is waiting for everybody to agree with you later. That's all you're doing. So that's your edge. Don't think, oh, I'm going to go and look at the chart and look at the entry. Don't even look at the f-ing chart. If you're an investor, don't look at the price chart. You're just going to cloud your judgment into what you believe is the fundamental reason you're buying it. And then you will end up selling it over before a year and then you've broken your rule. So just just, just be an investor, whatever price. If you think it's good, buy it at the levels you... Be- if you're looking at, say, a stock, for instance, like, and this is not going crypto, but the ultimate fundamental value of a stock, in my opinion, and this is not just my opinion, actually, this is just quite well known, actually. Say you have something in crypto, which you're looking at it, and it's making this much money, and it's giving you a yield on something. That's the valuation you put on it. And say, if it's below that, I buy. If it's above that, I'll sell. And then hold it for a year or longer, depending on whatever your strat is. Thank you for the green tea. I'm loving it. I'm absolutely no buzzing off the caffeine right now, brother. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so glad you touched on so many interesting things, because I've done exactly what you painted in the beginning, right? So I've done a few cycles with Bitcoin. First cycle, I wasn't even know what I was doing. I was just like, cashed a million dollar. And then it went to 19,000, let's call it 20K. And it went all the way down to 1,000, uh, sorry, 3,000. Yeah, right? yeah. So we had dropped from 20 to three. And I was like, holy f-. I mean, I didn't lose anything because no I, I still yeah. had the same amount of Bitcoin, but in dollars, I've lost a f- ton of money. So I was like, okay, how can I play this a little bit better? Because I can still use a slice of my Bitcoins to be more strategic. Yeah. So that's this is where I decided to split my Bitcoins in different bags. For example, yeah. new coins now are really hot. I take the pie and I go, how much am I willing to risk? Because this thing can go to nothing. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, you're not going to win all of the calls. We just need one to go. Yeah, and yeah. the one that goes is going to make up for all the money we invested into the other 10, 15, right? I want to make one point on this, okay. what you're saying as well. Specifically crypto, what, what Silicon Valley is, is going to become is early stage investments in crypto companies and all companies eventually are going to raise the same way as crypto companies do today. So I would say that the whole Silicon Valley venture capital space will just be companies raising money with a token and they're generally giving it to KOLs who are advertisers as well. So they're raising money and also getting an advertiser at the same time. That's going to happen globally, I think, with all types of industries. But I would say there's one point you made, which is really, really good. You can put a thousand and get 90k out, and there's really not been like that couple kind of opportunity for literally, even if you are say my dad or your dad or even their dad, like there really hasn't been that opportunity. Maybe if you went back to the beginning of the internet stock era, but it's not these types of ridiculous and the liquidity so In an instantly. Instant. And also a lot of it isn't even using order books. So we're using AMM pools, and that's is what's going to eventually come for exchanges as well. But that's another whole topic. But this, I, I would say this, I have made on Matic, I got in at Matic at four cents. And there's no way I could have traded better than what it gave me in terms of the appreciation of the dollar valuation of what it is, because I ended up buying it at four cents, 50, 60K, made millions of dollars that trade. I sold out at $2 or whatever it was, $2.50. And I put all of that into Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin went up I was just like, oh my God, like it, it, it was, it was one of those ones where it was just ridiculous. And like, there's no way, because like I said before, you can wait for appreciation in the US dollar value of the thing you own, or you can look at how much of the thing I'm getting more of. There's two different ways of analyzing what your trade is. Going from Matic and then into Bitcoin, I just saw huge increase of US dollar valuation into a big number of Bitcoin, which then went up in a US dollar valuation. I was like, oh, for f- sake, this is just two. And I would agree with you, dude, that there's probably... 
I would even sometimes say when the, um, the environment is right to do a little bit more of that in terms of low cap. I call them shitties. So meme coins are shitties. Shit coins are shit coins, right? We know that. <laughs> but there's, a, there's like three different <laughs> levels. So you have the <laughs> Ethereum is the shit coin factory. Yeah. A Solana is the shitties factory. Most unbelievably unvaluable thing you'll ever buy in your life. But it's like people will love that because it's gambling. There's a lot of scams as well. So you have to be careful. But I would say, like you said before, diversify the portfolio across it. I don't do it anymore. I, 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 I don't want a pacemaker, a pacemaker at 31. Okay, I want to chill the out. And when, once the numbers get bigger, you do have less appetite for extreme aggressive risk. And that's fine because like you don't need it. If you are someone like, for example, Michael Saylor, who has a ton of capital, you don't, you don't want to even think about the shitty factory thing because you just want to, and by the way, Bitcoin is already a risk compared to S&P, gold, for example. So you already, let's say, your risk is already higher. But yep. if you're someone who has maybe 10K, 15K, and he wants to go to maybe having one Bitcoin, I think it might be worth to take a portion of that portfolio and say, I'm going to hustle harder because I need, with Bitcoin, if you have $10,000 today and you just buy 10,000 worth of Satoshis, mm. it's good. Yeah, great. Go for it. But it's not going to give you the same amount of return at a meme yeah. coin, for example, yeah, yeah. or a altcoin on, on Ethereum or Solana, whatever it might be. So having a portion of that, I usually say, not more than 50%, 25% Ethereum, 25% whatever, and you can go down in the list mm. having some meme coins. I think nowadays could be a play, but there is so many ways to skin the cat, right? Depending yeah, I actually made a joke about that the other night. I was like, a million ways to skin a cat, and I was like, what the f is this expression about? I know, right? Why so are we will... skinning cats? <laughs> I know. Like, skin a f it should be shear a sheep or something. Exactly. So why would you leave the cats alone, by the way? <laughs> so there's so many different ways to play the market, right? Yeah. And depending on you, on your, on your, on your age uh, of time frame, risk tolerance, you can play the market. You know, that we've seen DeFi, we've seen NFTs, we've seen meme coins. We will always have something new on every cycle. So I think if you are someone who wants to multiply their Bitcoins or make more money, I think you should look into these things. Uh, mm. That's for sure. But as long as you don't go all degen and take your profit. Cause yeah, and be disciplined on what you're saying. And exactly. also, you've got to remember, I have 25, 25, 25, 25. But then you have to remember is what is the allocation of Bitcoin to altcoins in each section? Okay, because it's like, for instance, I said that I have a swing trading strategy, which is my bot. But it only sold 40% of my Bitcoin within the allocation of Bitcoin in that 25%. Exactly. So it's a, a, the thing is about trading. And, you know, you have a lot of people who come out and they say all of the big buzzwords. But there is so many more. It's like almost where, you know, Russian dolls. It's like you, there's so many things which you go down and most things you look at are actually more complicated than they begin to be when you start scratching below the surface to actually make it work. Like I'm saying, you can say, oh, I do this and I swing this and I do that. But actually to actually make it work, even the time management, having the right appropriate risk, sorting out which exchange, making sure this is working, making sure that your bot fires at the right point, making sure that... When you go into a trade, you stick to your principles, write down your parameters. Do it. It's so, so difficult. It's not sexy. Everyone thinks trading is sexy. It's not. It's the opposite. It's like, and that's why a lot of the content you see about trading is always the, what you are after you become a successful trader. Because it's all as about, trading is about what do you become after you become financially free because you're a trader. And it's not fun, but that's good. It's definitely sculpted me as a human being. It's changed me as a human being. I'm much more objective. I can handle my emotions much better. Depends on how many drinks I've had, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll keep it at that. But like, no, no, it, it really is a great thing to do, but it's very hard. And like, I would just say, like, if you're going to come into it, like a lot of people do with their, you know, bushy tail and, you know, starry eyes or whatever you want to call it, you're going to go, you're going to end up, you know, that, that meme where it's like Leonardo DiCaprio and it's like him doing the champagne glass like that. And then it's like the reverend and he's all, up it's like that you're gonna go through the bear attack like at some yeah. point and also you are probably gonna lose everything once or twice so don't start with a million dollars please start with 10k and that's it and lose it all but that's why i always say what you said good point is i have some which is always invested and some which is always dca and some that's always bot or, or, or swing trading strategies just so you have safeguards because you've got to play chess like i always say this the the market is chess but it's also poker and risk management combined. And you need to, when you play against the market, you just have to get, it's like you, a lot of people do this. They go into one trade and they get out of a trade. They go into one trade and get out of a trade. That's like playing one place ahead on the chessboard. 
you're not going to get anywhere with that. You need to have it so you're looking at every single situation. Instead of trying to say, I think the price is going to do this, I'm then going to trade accordingly to what I think it's going to do. You don't even look at it like that. You have to look at it in a way you say, this is the potential scenarios. These are the potential outcomes. How can I position myself in a way that every single exit is covered? And if this happens because it might happen, I have an insurance policy. I have a short hedge. I have a long buy. I have my spot buying. I have a DCA thing happening. And you just got to constantly just say, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I need to have an appropriate process to mitigate all of the issues. And I promise you, it's so much harder than it is said done. Because the market is constantly changing and evolving in environments and things you can't foresee and it's chaotic. It's so chaotic. Like you're literally trying to like you're trying to just constantly play chess against millions of people indirectly buying and selling, and there's an equilibrium of price at that moment, and there's thousands of things you could not even dream of understanding every single second. So they say it's a great quote by Mark Douglas. The market makes the fools out the most. And also he talks about reality gaps as well. Like there's a huge reality gap between, you know, actually investing and trading and they're two different things. And like a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to come and invest in the market and do all this because it's going to be nice and easy and I'm going to sit there with Warren Buffett and I'm not going to do anything. I think one thing is to have a plan and one thing is to stick to the plan. It is okay to pivot, which is necessary because I don't think you can find immediately your, your goal straight away. It's not going to be a straight line. It's okay to pivot. But when you do something and you, you go, ah, I know better now, and you forget. I see a lot of successful traders. I know a lot of successful traders. I know a lot of guys who have made millions of dollars, and it's not even just crypto, all the way through the whole spectrum. And they all have a very common theme. And it's that they have the potential and they have the humility to accept that they're wrong. And when the plan is not working, they do adapt and change. And like, this is, and this is actually not just even in trading. You see this across the board of every single type of successful person. They have the ability to say, I actually am completely wrong. And I am now going to do the opposite of what I thought because I want to be right. <laughs> I have a quote, I say, people would rather be right than rich. And if you want to be right the whole time in trading, you will go home with nothing because you can't. And you have to admit the fact that you need to be wrong. It's very humbling, but if you're gonna be successful and make a lot of money, there's also a transition period. So say you have an environment which is swing and it turns to scalp and it's over 10 years and you've been, it's been say swing, the market's been swinging for 10 years and it changes into range bound, completely different market cycle. It's the people who can say, it's been doing this for 10 years, but now I'm looking at my equity curve, I'm gonna analyze what I've got and I'm gonna change because I do believe that now it's time to move on to a different thing. This is not gonna happen anymore, I'm wrong, it's not gonna an uptrend and then this being able to switch you can have guys who make money for 10 years and lose it all in a transition between two market environments and it's hard to watch because like we've all done it look at bitcoin you know i didn't no one really thought we we're going to go into such a drastic bear market in the last cycle but if you didn't have a stop loss and you weren't looking at 48 and you were like no i'm going to keep buying all the way down you would have two years of opportunity cost of zero you got to have a little bit of your money. I sold like 500k of altcoins up there, some Bitcoin. I was shorting when the dealers got short 48. But then a very good example was the beginning of this this bull market. Lots of people just couldn't get in their head that we've broken out of 30k resistance. There's no logical short or trade. You have to wait for a retest. And a lot of guys just shorted the whole way up this thing. And they've gone quiet now because they got no money left or they just didn't have any trades open in the first place. They were just lying about it. But like... You have to remember there's a few different factors here. If you can't switch your bias and you can't admit you're wrong, you don't just have the cost of the short open positions and the, and the cost of having open shorts. You also have opportunity cost. It went up hundreds of percent and you were shorting the whole way down. It's not like when it goes up and then your short eventually goes into profit, you were a winner. No, you still lost 120 of opportunity as well. Oh. And you, you could have been in another asset class. So you, you're not just wasting money, you're wasting time. Just because you think that, no, no, it has to go down now. No, no, it has to go down. No, 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 it has to go down now. And it's like that mindset of not being able to humble yourself and say, my job is not to tell the market what it's going to do. My job is to capture the movement of the market and prepare for what it's going to do. With traders, you don't need to know where it's going to go. You don't need to know anything about where the price is going to go to make money as a trader. If you want to be an analyst and you want to say, I think this is going to happen and then it does and it looks sexy and then you think you're a f***ing god, do not get mixed up between traders, analysts, and investors. A trader will say, look, mate, I ain't got a clue, mate, to be honest, but here's my short, here's my long, here's my risk, here's my stop loss, here's the entry if it comes here. I've got a conditional order here as well. Everything's there. Wait for it to happen. 
analyst. Oh no, it's gonna go down. Oh, I haven't even got any open positions, but I'm still gonna fucking talk about it the whole way up. And then, and then it eventually goes down. So it goes up 500% and goes down 10. Look at me. <laughs> I was right. Nah, bro, honestly, it's laughable. But I just wanna say that to your, the people watching. And also just make sure investing is different as well. So yep. just, there's like multiple things. Well, I talk about this in my groups. I have VIP things. I talk, I, I educate people. I do the whole fucking nine yards. MDX algo is growing like crazy, bro. Of course, everything is going to be linked down below. And we can have a part two because last time the fire damage, <laughs> there was a section on the mindset, which I loved. So stay tuned for part two, which we're going to talk yeah, about we'll do the that. mindset. Super important. But um, Max, we went down man, the trading route a bit pleasure, on that one. <laughs> a pleasure having you on the studio. Thank you so much. You're a legend, bro. I appreciate it. Cool, man. Thank you guys for watching. See you on the next one. Mm -hmm.